Hello, everybody. This is part two of our series on motion, energy, and gravity. And this time we're going to be focusing on Newton's laws of motion. So first of all, let's talk about Isaac Newton for a minute. Um, this is a one pound note. These don't exist anymore. Uh, when I was a, a kid in the uh, in middle and high school uh, during the 80s, the pounds started to disappear after the uh, invention of the one pound coin. And by the time I was in college, you basically couldn't find one pound notes at all. But Isaac Newton used to be on the one pound note. Uh, that's you know the equivalent of having um, George Washington on the one dollar bill. Now, what's important about Isaac Newton is that you know Copernicus and Kepler uh, looked at how the planets move and came up with descriptions for how the planets move, but they didn't know why. What Newton did was to figure out why. So let's go through his laws briefly. He has uh, three laws of motion. First law is everybody continues in a state of rest or in a state of uniform motion in a straight line, unless it is compelled to change that state by a force acting on it. Okay, what does that mean? What it means is that if an object is moving, it will be moving in a straight line and it will continue to do so. And if an object is at rest, not moving, it will remain so. And the only way to change that is to apply a force. So an example of this is that you can put a spaceship into space and it doesn't need fuel. It's going to keep moving. If you push it, it's just going to keep drifting off in that same direction as long as there are no forces acting on it. Newton's second law is F equals MA. Now, equations scare comes some people, so let's talk about what this really means. In this case, F is force, M is mass, and A is acceleration. And I want you to think about uh, a, a thought experiment where I've got two blocks, uh, bricks basically, where one is made of polystyrene and the other is made of lead. And I'm pushing them equally with both hands. One of them is gonna move more than the other. And that can be understood in terms of F equals MA. So my push with my hands pushing them equally, that's the force that's pushing them. But because the masses are different, so the polystyrene block has a low mass and the um, lead block has a high mass, that means that for the low mass, the acceleration has to be more. Remember, acceleration is how you change velocity. So as I'm pushing it, both of them are going to change their speed. They're both going to accelerate, but one of them is going to accelerate a lot more because it has much lower mass. And so that's how you can understand this. Um, you can also understand it in terms of things like, you know, a motorbike needs only a very small engine versus a big rig that needs a really big engine to, to pull all the stuff that it's pulling um, in order to go at the same sort of speeds. So here I've got, um, you know, what, what's going on with these uh, little objects here. Again, these are balls. They've all got the same mass and they've got a certain amount of force that they hit with. So if we look at the, at the swinging ball on the left, when it hits the ball next to it, it, it stops moving. That means that it has decelerated. And that means that there must be a force that is stopping it uh, from moving, right? That's not only the first law, but then the second law tells us by how much. So if I know the mass of the ball, and I know that it's gone from a certain speed down to nothing, I can work out the force. It then hits the ball next to it, which hits the ball next to it, which hits the ball next to it. And then the ball on the right, which doesn't have another ball next to it, um, that one then receives that hit and that force causes it to accelerate. And so we can understand how a Newton's cradle moves according to Newton's second law. Another thing we can think about is how Newton's second law applies to um, having things moving in a curve. So here again, I've got uh, someone holding on to a ball on a string and it's swinging around. And when it's in this position, if it was, if there wasn't a force being applied to it, it should keep going in a straight line. Remember that's Newton's first law, it should keep going this way. So there must be a force acting on it that is holding it in place. And that force is going to be given by the mass of the ball times the acceleration that it feels to keep it in a circle. And so that is going to describe what the force is, and that's the tension on the string. Okay, let's move on to Newton's third law. Newton's third law basically says that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. 
A good example of this is that a rocket is propelled upward by a force equal and opposite to the force with which gas is expelled out its back. So that rocket is moving because it is moving equal and opposite to the gas coming out of the jets. So we have three laws from Newton. Let's now talk about how that applies to how planets move. Let's think about the Earth. We know that there must be a force acting on the Earth for it to travel around a curve. Remember that Newton's first law says that things keep moving in a straight line at a constant speed, that's what uniform motion means, unless a force is acting on it. Since the Earth and all the other planets are moving in curves, there must be forces acting on them. The Earth is putting as much force on the Sun as the Sun is putting on the Earth. That is the third law, right? For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So as much as the sun is pulling on the Earth to keep it going in orbit, the Earth is pulling on the sun. But the sun is much more massive, so the effect of the force is less. Remember Newton's second law. So when we talk about there's this force, F, but when the mass is the Earth, it's going to accelerate quite a lot because the mass is small. But when the mass is the sun, the acceleration is very small. So they're both feeling the same force, but for the Earth, it has a much bigger effect because of Earth's much lower mass. And so by applying Newton's three laws, we can understand why the Earth is revolving around the sun and not the sun revolving around the Earth. So here we can see a uh, an image of the sun and the Earth, so it could be any other planet. The planet is moving in its curve. And to hold it in this orbit, there must be a force acting on it. That's the gravitational pull of the sun. Remember that the Earth is also pulling on the sun, but the sun is so massive that it doesn't really feel much. If the gravitational pull of the Earth disappeared, the Earth would just keep going in this direction, tangential to the orbit, that is perpendicular to the direction to the sun. Actually, there is a little bit of a pull by the planets on the sun and in fact on other stars. So here you can see a fairly big planet and a star and they're actually going around a point between them that is the center of gravity. And we'll get back to that in a future video. Um, but for the sun, you can imagine that with all the different planets going around, where the sun is going around, where, what the sun is orbiting, depends on exactly where all the planets are. So starting here in 1945, actually the sun would have been going around to this point outside of the sun. Here we can see the yellow sun. You've got the core of the sun here, and this is the main part of the sun. And you can see that in the 50s and then again in the 90s when I was in, uh, in college, we actually, the, the sun was actually more or less spinning on its center. But there are other times like in the late 50s and in the 80s um, that, in fact, the sun was spinning around a point much further away. And so, and this is to do with the fact that, you know, the planets are pulling back on the sun. So it's not just spinning on its axis.